I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in liaison psychiatry, which means that I end up seeing people from around the hospital for lots of different reasons. So sometimes they've had a trauma, sometimes they have some kind of extremely difficult diagnosis, sometimes they have a challenging relationship with their doctors or with their medical regime, or sometimes they're just feeling low or feeling anxious for all the reasons that people with illnesses feel low or feel anxious. And the reason why they have psychologists in general hospitals is because having a chronic illness or having an acute illness is really difficult and it has an impact on people. And so it's the hospital's way of kind of acknowledging that yes, you have an illness, but that there's other stuff that goes on around that too in terms of mood and behavior and difficulties that, other people, that people might be experiencing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about chronic illness and what that means, experiencing a chronic illness. I'm also going to talk about looking at illness as part of the broader piece of your life, that it isn't just the only focus. And I'm also going to talk about ways that people cope, different coping styles, and then maybe some things that can help with, with boosting coping ability, with working with the resilience that you already have to help you manage um, illness and all the things that come along with illness. When we think about illness, a lot of people think about illness as kind of an acute thing, that it, that it happens, that it's fast, that people get sick, they go to their doctor, this is the model that we have as children. They go to their doctor, they get some medicine, they take their medicine, and they feel better. But as we get older, as things happen, and we experience a chronic illness, it's actually a very different kind of a journey. And it asks us to do things that are very different than what we have to do as an acute illness. There are a lot of demands when you have a chronic illness on your time, on your resources, financial resources, but also other people that need to help or work or all those other things that go along with it, on your body and on your support system, and also on your, your mental stamina. And when we're young and healthy or before we have a chronic illness or whatever, we have kind of a myth in our heads that we're in control of our bodies or of our lives. And so when we're diagnosed with an acute or a chronic illness, it suddenly challenges that myth. And we realize how fragile our bodies really are and how little control we sometimes have over what's going to happen to us. And that sense of, of not knowing what the next thing might hold can be really difficult to manage because we're used to feeling like we're kind of in control of things. And of course, there's a whole new cast of characters that comes along when we're diagnosed with a chronic illness. There's the nurses that we meet, the doctors, there's the psychologists, there's the administrative staff, all the phone calls we have to make for appointments. There's all these extra people in our lives that we need to connect with and manage and think about in order to, to manage our chronic illness, the public health nurses, all those extra people that become part of our network. And also that things change over time, that we're constantly having to adapt to maybe a new sy symptom, or a new way of managing symptoms, or a new consultant, or a new registrar, or a new SHO, or all the change that happens in the hospital. So actually, once you have a chronic illness, you know, it can feel like a full-time job because there's all this extra stuff that comes along with it. And my job is to kind of acknowledge that, that you're not just kind of passively sitting there getting treated, that also your lives are part of this and your coping strategies are part of this and your strengths are part of your wellness journey. So what have you already had to learn since you got sick? What extra skills? Learn how to breathe properly, something that you would have taken for granted before. Exactly. So learn new breathing techniques, learning how to cope emotionally. Come into terms with the fact that you're sick at all. Yes. Yeah. So kind of this emotional work, but also real practical, learning breathing techniques. You know, learning the number for the, t for the hospital, learning which, which secretary to call to get an appointment, learning to ask for help, you know, learning to manage other people's expectations of your illness, learning who will help when you ask them and who won't. Right? So there's all these extra things that you've had to learn. Managing medication, that's a whole skill in itself. You know, getting to know the pharmacy, all that stuff that comes along with so acknowledging the fact that you've already learned a ton here. You manage your symptoms, okay? So breathlessness or fatigue or pain or all the other stuff that goes along with having a chronic illness. You've learned new behaviors for treatment. So that's what you're talking about when you're talking about breathing strategies. 
You've also learned how to maintain your health over time once you have a chronic illness. Like what are the things that make me feel better? What are the things that undermine my, my sense of uh, feeling better? Maintaining adequate relationships with healthcare providers. So getting on with your doctors, which can be very, very challenging. Getting on with a psychologist is easy. We're so nice. No, that's not true. We are also very challenging. But you know, having to manage those relationships and the fact that those relationships actually impact on how you feel is a really important lesson, that if you can access what you need to access, if you can maintain relationships, that that makes it easier. Managing the emotional and social consequences of illness. So coming to terms with being sick or coping with being sick. All of these things that you all have, have to learn, that they're tasks that you are charged with simply because you have a chronic illness. Maintaining relationships with family and friends. That can be really hard when you have a chronic illness. Like who can you call? Who do you not want to call? How do they feel about your illness? All the extra stuff that we think about in our social network when we have a chronic illness, like not being able to go out as much as you used to or not being able to do the stuff that you used to. And then kind of the protecting yourself from loss, like not thinking too much about the negative, trying to manage that side of things, or maybe talking to some people about how you feel but not talking to other people because you don't want to burden them. What can I uh, reveal? What can I discuss? How is it going to impact on other people? It's a task. And then constantly adjusting over and over to new symptoms or to new management systems or to new doctors or whatever. That there's a real call. There's a real call on your flexibility. Your flexibility of thinking but also behavior. Being able to change with new symptoms. So acknowledging that all of this stuff is also going into how you're managing your symptoms and how you're managing your long-term illness. How do we think about coping? You know, two different people can be coping with the same thing and look very different. And this is something I hear a lot in my work. You know, people say, oh, so-and-so, she isn't coping, or he's not coping, or he doesn't want to talk about it, he's not coping, whatever. And it's really important to think about what you mean when you talk about coping, because you, people can be very distressed. They can be crying, they can be angry, they can be whatever. And they can also be coping at the same time. Okay, that it's not kind of an on-off switch. It's not when I feel okay, I'm coping. When I'm upset, I'm not coping. You know, coping is a longer term kind of a thing. And it's okay to be upset as part of you having an illness or just being a human. People with chronic illness are more vulnerable in some ways. Like the research shows, you're more vulnerable to depression, you're more vulnerable to anxiety. For good reason, okay? We just went through the list of extra tasks that you have to do. And also, you're undermined in terms of your wellness. You know, so fatigue and pain and all that extra stuff that you have to deal with. So the downside is that you are more vulnerable. One of the very small upsides is that there is some research as well around resiliency with chronic illness, around the ability of people with long-term illnesses to connect with other people. There's some lovely research around empathy building. That yes, sure, when you've had something yourself, it is easier to connect with other people who are in distress. And there is a strengthening sometimes in relationships. So thinking about all of this stuff as, as a whole, that yes, you have a, a chronic illness, but you also have the rest of your life to be thinking about too. And all of these things interact with one another. And there's a lovely model that I often use that comes from cognitive behavior therapy. This is called the five-factor model. All right. And you can see the five factors here. You've got like the wider environment, which is all the stuff around you, your family and your friends and your work maybe, or your house or your housing estate or all your neighbors and all that stuff. And then within that, You've got the way that you think about things. You've got your moods, so your emotions, sadness, happiness, you know, all that stuff. You've got your physical functioning, which is how your body is actually functioning, and also sleep, and also nutrition, all that stuff. And then you have your behavior. So that's just what you're actually doing, like where your body's going. Are you going out? Are you not going out? All that kind of stuff. And you think about all these five factors as being linked to one another, OK? Not as being individual pieces. So of course, if you have an illness, if, you're, if your wellness is impacted, that's going to affect the way that you think about things. It's going to affect your mood sometimes. It's going to affect what you actually get up to. And all of that then impacts on the wider environment. All of these things are connected. And so when you've had a real um, blow to your, to your body, to your physical symptoms or whatever, all of this can be affected in a very negative way, or in a mildly negative way. You know, things can kind of go south together. 
But the upside of this model is acknowledging that we also have these other pieces in addition to our physical functioning. That sometimes we can impact the way that we're feeling by looking at the way we think about things or by looking at what we're doing to manage our mood. Am I actually having any fun in my life? Am I doing anything positive? Am I actually scheduling a little bit of fun, a little bit of playtime? Am I seeing my friends? Am I getting out? Am I doing exercise? Am I doing all the other things that support, the behavior things that then support mood and the way I think about things? So it gives us a way in to support ourselves in terms of coping from a lot of different angles. And of course, panic and breathing are very interrelated. So when you have something like COPD, it can be a real challenge to anxiety because breathing is such a core part of our day-to-day our -day life. And it's so easy when we have difficulties with breathing for that to in increase our anxiety. Panic often starts with physical sensation, like shortness of breath. Sometimes people experience panic because they, ex they experience like rapid heartbeat or tingling in their hands and feet or a sense of dizziness. And once you notice something like that, you start to pay attention. You get an internal focus and you're like, what the heck is going on with the tingling in my hands and my feet or whatever it is? And you start paying attention to that. And this is where you all come in around what you do with that. So somebody who's going into a panic attack, they'd get their shortness of breath or they'd get their tingling or their dizzy sensation. They'd take stock of it in that second, second little square there. They'd say, what's going on here? And then somebody who's heading into panic might say, holy cow, I'm having a heart attack. Or I'm going to collapse or whatever it is. They're going to have some kind of catastrophic, what I'd call a catastrophic thought around what's going to happen next. Once you have a thought like that, something happens to your body. You go into more of an anxious zone, OK? So you end up having a little bit more agitation, a little bit more fear. And once you have more fear, of course, you get physical symptoms that go along with that. So you're going to tense up a little bit more. So then you might get a little bit of pain or a little bit more difficulty in, some, in breathing or whatever it is. And you get that fight or flight response and then increase physical symptoms more thinking, and you end up in that panic spiral. So when we talk about panic or managing panic, we talk about dealing with it either in between those first two boxes in terms of managing our attention, or in between this second box and this third box in terms of how we think about it. So even just noticing if we're having a catastrophic thought can actually derail a panic attack. How we're holding the information about what our symptoms mean is actually really important to managing mood or anxiety that when we're having a physical symptom, that there are other ways to impact how we're feeling, that we can look at managing our mood or managing our thoughts to kind of boost the whole system. What is your favorite way of managing your illness? Go to sleep, take a break, take a nap, talking about it, not talking about it, crying, you know, saying nobody knows what I'm going through, which is a way of kind of reaching out in a funny way. Anybody have fun? Anybody do fun stuff? Going shopping, thank you. Something fun. Yes, gardening, excellent. Dog, pets, yeah, reaching out to your pet. Exercise, walking, so tons of different things. And the thing is to think about coping in different ways. Active problem solvers, they're the real copers. You know, the people who get in there, they break down their problems, they sort them out and they move forward. And it is a really great coping strategy. If you can solve your problem, that's a really good way to cope with it. The problem is that we also have issues that are not solvable. Okay, like chronic illness. We can manage it, but we can't solve it. Okay, and that's where emotion focused coping comes in, which is equally as important as problem solving. How do we manage the stuff that we can't change? And that's when we talk about talking to other people, reaching out, or meditation, or prayer, or, you know, stuff like that, having fun, making sure our lives are balanced. That's emotion-focused coping, feeling connected to other people. All right? And that's really important when we have a problem that we actually can't solve. And then avoidance. Thank goodness we got a great example of avoidance there, which is like, actually, I don't want to talk about it. And that is a coping strategy. Okay? We used to say, like, oh, no, avoidance, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But actually, taking a break from stuff can be a really good coping strategy. You don't have to talk about your illness all the time. It's good if you have pockets or people you trust or somebody that you can link in with, but avoiding the subject sometimes can be a coping strategy and don't be too hard on yourselves about it. So the trick, as I got up here, is to find a balance. You know, to do problem solving on the stuff where you can solve problems, 
to do the emotion-focused coping on the stuff where you can't solve problems, and to take breaks, use avoidance. So things that can be important in how we're coping with our illness. Things like mood, okay? Your mood is actually really important. So you should be taking care of your mood, how you're feeling, okay? Um, your, the way you think about things. So catching yourself if you're having those kind of catastrophic thoughts. If you're noticing a lot of negative thinking, you know, attending to that, querying it, maybe saying, challenging it a little bit and saying, well, actually, you know, are there things in my life that aren't so bad? Coping skills, so working on the things that we were talking about in terms of problem solving, emotion focused coping, that can have a big impact. Other people's reactions can have a big impact. So sometimes we have very sympathetic families, sometimes not so much. Sometimes our wife is saying, but you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> and that can have an impact. So choosing the people that we're talking to can sometimes uh, help us out there. Support from family and friends. Social interests. So making sure that we actually are doing something, that we have an interest, that we are following our bliss or whatever it is, you know, because sometimes when we have an illness or when we have a period of depression or when we have a bereavement or when we have whatever, a difficulty in our lives, people can withdraw and they can say, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to cut back on all this extra stress and just focus on my one thing. Okay? And in the short term, that can be really effective, but the challenge with that is that then we don't go back out. You know, that we cut back, cut back, cut back, and then suddenly our lives are quite, quite isolated. Activity levels. So that, somebody said exercise. Thank God somebody said exercise. But actually that does have an, a big impact on how we cope and on mood. And managing other external worries. So obviously if there's financial stuff, all that stuff, that can impact on how you're coping with your illness. And things that help. Oh, look, number one there. Increase pleasant activities. Okay, the psychologist said, I should have more fun. If I have a chronic illness, I should have even more fun. Don't wait for motivation. Don't wait to feel like doing stuff. Okay, because if you're going through a period of low mood or difficulty, motivation is one of the first things to go. So if you wait to feel like doing something before you do it, you might be waiting a long time. So sometimes it's good to get the movement, the behavior started first. And you might find that the motivation follows. Challenging negative thinking, I already spoke about that. Making caring for yourself mentally a priority. So that's, again, mood, mood, mood. It's actually really important that you care for your mood, that you take care of that piece. Make relaxation a goal, not a luxury. I mean, we get this a lot where it's like, when everything else is done, then I can relax. But the problem is that the other stuff is never done. You know, whether it's work or housework or caring for people or whatever it is, it's never done. So trying to bring the relaxation piece forward rather than waiting until everything is done before we relax. And when I say relaxation, I'm not talking about watching TV or chilling out or whatever, although that's also very important and can be a lot of fun. What I'm talking about is actually like a relaxation program. So maybe meditation or maybe progressive muscle relaxation, that type of thing. There's an online resource here that you can use, the um, Mindfulness and Relaxation Center, www.beaumont.ie forward slash M-A-R-C. And there's free downloads there. So that can actually be really helpful for just starting a relaxation program. Avoid avoiding all the time. So basically use avoidance, but don't use it all the time. Practice asking for help. Finding a good routine. Human animals like a bit of routine. So, you know, whether that's sleep or eating or whatever, just having a bit of a routine in your life can actually really support mood. You know, having a routine before bed can really improve sleep. Reaching out to other people is really important for supporting our health, our mental health, and also our physical health. It doesn't have to be talking about our illness all the time, but just making an effort to connect with people. Reaching in for meaning, so things like prayer or meditation or reflection, you know, thinking about our lives uh, as a continuum, as a narrative, and what we've learned as well as the difficulties that we've encountered, and other stuff, other stuff that you guys are already doing. So very simply, oh look, number one, have fun, talk, solve the problems you can solve, challenge yourself, so that's that piece around motivation. No, don't wait to feel like doing something. If you're feeling low, you're not gonna feel like doing anything. So pushing yourself a little bit, challenge the negative thinking, and breathe, and I'm obviously talking to a COPD audience here, that can be a challenge, but it can also be a way of noticing what's happening for you, of taking a minute. We have a, a resource here at Beaumont as well called Better Health, Better Living. It's a six-week program for people coping with chronic illness. It's a workshop series. 
ask one of the staff about it and we're happy to send a referral on for you. It's a very well researched program. It's out of Stanford University and it really works with people to manage their own coping. So it's about self-management. Um, it talks about all the stuff that, that you already know about in terms of uh, exercise and nutrition and all that. But it also brings patients together to talk about what works for them. And that can be really helpful too. And it's run by patient volunteers and healthcare professionals. So it's people who have chronic illnesses who are running the program. So that might be an option for you as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.